the recording. Um, and if you have a look at the document, which Siobhan will be able to share, which has got some of those kind of top tips in it. Um, and she talked through, I guess, some kind of tools and techniques on making Zoom calls more interesting. So we're going to try a couple of those today. So the first one is a poll. So this should be popping up on all your screens just now is a poll where I would like you to think on a scale of one to five, how present are you? So it's the end of the week, it is Friday, I'm conscious you've all had a very busy week. So on a scale of one, I have 10 tabs open and there's a dog barking and my children are pulling my legs. To five, I am totally with you, this video chat is like Zen meditation. Where are you in that spectrum of one to five? So it'd be good to hear where everyone is at. Oh, look at these, it's coming thick and fast, right? There's more people on the waiting list as well. That's exciting. Okay, right. Everyone, the, the majority of people are around about that kind of four mark, which is good. Lots of people in the th in the threes. Um, there's only there's only two people at a at level where there's a dog barking and they've got another meeting top on in 15 minutes. 13 percent are totally with me in this video chat. It's like Zen meditation. That is amazing. I think you're liars, but yeah, uh, that's that's fine. Okay, <laughs> so it's good to get a sense of where everyone is at, at the moment. Right, Maddie is going to do something that I was uncomfortable doing because I'm Scottish, but she, Beth is from California, so it was like totally comfortable for her to do it. So Maddie, take it away. I'm not going to make everybody do a virtual hug. I believe that happened on a, a different net squared call, and one of my friends messaged me going, "Oh my God, we had to hug virtually. It was just awful." Interesting. Um, so yesterday on, on Beth Cantor's call, one of the, as Ross said, one of the things that she did was that, first of all, the poll, and then she did what she called a minute of silence. And it, the idea behind it is just to take a minute before we start. So as we said, most of us are, are in the right headspace already. So it is to fully it help us to get fully present in the room um, and just to take this minute just to breathe deeply to let things go so that we were absolutely shifting up to that five and that we are here and fully present. And this is, that's the bit that makes Ross feel uncomfortable. <laughs> so for some folk yesterday, it was like, oh God, a whole minute, it's, it's too long. And for others, it was like, this is the first time I've taken a minute to myself since all of this started. So we're going to give that a shot today and feedback is always very, very welcome. So I've got a timer here. So we'll just have our, our minute of silence, so we'll all go on mute and uh, we'll take it from there. So that's our minute started. Okay, that's our thank you for those of you who managed to do that. Hope you found that useful. Um, and back over to Ross. I, I do actually enjoy that. I do think it's quite nice. It's just like there's something inside me that can't introduce it as a concept. It's just, I need to get over myself. Right, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, we're going we're gonna to hear from a, a couple of speakers. Now, Siobhan is working on a document at the moment, which we're going to be putting in the link in the chat. So it's a shared Google Doc, and we do these for each of the calls. And in that document, what we'll be doing is basically pulling out any of the resources or signposting or top tips into that single space. So you'll be able to follow that in the chat itself. So for those of you who don't know how the chat works on a Zoom, if you click down the bottom, you'll see a little uh, speech ball icon and it will say chat underneath. When you click that, the chat box will open up and um, you can chat um, and add in any questions or you can share resources or case studies 
or any links. So that's the space if you're wanting to ask questions as stuff's going along. There'll be a Q&A after we hear from the four speakers. But if there's anything that's kind of top of mind at the moment, you can put it in there and we'll be able to pick that stuff up. Um, but there's loads of resources that come out of every call and rather than you try to scramble and copy and paste them out of that chat box, we keep them in a single document for you just so it's a bit easier for everyone. So once Siobhan's got that ready, you'll see that coming uh, to the chat. So um, first person we're going to hear from is going to be Jenny Patterson from Breakthrough Dundee. So Jenny was uh, one of the senior leaders who came on the SCBO Digital Senior Leaders Programme. Um, so she's going to talk a wee bit about some of the changes they've made. Now it's quite interesting actually, I think, for this organisation where, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Jenny, a lot of the work is skills-based, none of the skills are open. So it's like, where do you go from an organisation that's almost entirely skill-based to now there is no skills? So for me, this is like really interesting in terms of how you make that pivot and how you have to do that stuff quickly and what that looks like. So I'll hand you over to Jenny just now. Thanks, Ross. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? More to the point, can you see my cherry blossom behind me? Thank you. Okay, um, so yeah, as Ross says, we are um, an organisation that works pr predominantly in schools. And so we were a pretty new organisation as well. So in 2017, we launched um, and basically inspired by the MCR Pathways model. So if anybody's um, familiar with MCR Pathways, it's um, basically we work with care experienced and, um, and other vulnerable young people, particularly those who are living in very challenged circumstances. And there are three things that we do that, that have created challenges for us. One is that we deliver group work in schools. So, um, and yeah, socially distanced group work is not going to be a thing, I don't think. Um, group work, we also, um, we also deliver a really kind of unique and immersive work experience and taster sessions um, across the city of Dundee and all sorts of um, kind of all sorts of employers etc so that, that can't happen and the third thing which is probably the, the most critical thing that we do is that we match um, volunteer mentors um, from across the community with young people and those volunteer we've got 120 of live matches and people who, who were a pre-COVID meeting every every um, week in school for an hour um, face to face um, and building relationships so um, yeah, that, that kind of changed a few weeks ago. We, whenever we, got, we started to get the intelligence um, from Scottish government that the schools were likely to close and that they were likely to close potentially before the Easter holidays, we really had to start thinking on our feet. Actually, what, what can we do as an organization, not just to meet the, um, to meet the demands of, um, of the, the, and the, the impact of school closures on our, our really, really vulnerable young people. So that was one of our considerations. So, so one of the things that we did was we, we had to gather lots of information around who we thought was, it was potentially most at risk with the, with the school closures. And um, so some young people, as you probably will, will, will know, come to school to get a bit of peace and quiet. Some of them come to school to get fed. Some of them come to school to get a break and, that's, and have someone to talk to. So the fact that this would be pulled from underneath, you know, that that rug would be pulled from underneath them is really, really um, quite, quite um yeah a, a big challenge but also um yeah it made us quite concerned we also then had to think about well if we're going to try and um, and pivot our model not all of our young people will have access to technology and um, whether it's smartphones internet and all those sorts of things so we we, we we developed kind of our risk matrix that we were able to share with our schools because i have a staff member in every single secondary school in dundee and um, so we have those kind of relationships so we did that and then it, it kind of it kind of fell really neatly into the, the Easter holidays in Dundee and what I said to my staff at that point in time was just can you just let's just take a step back here because the kids that we work with are going to treat this as the holidays so I, actually I want you all to kind of take a bit of a step back at the minute as well and, and almost adjust to the new reality because we all have you know whether it's homeschooling or you know elderly parents or in-laws to look after and all those other things and home working on top of it so let's just do that and I think that kind of breather um, was really helpful for the team because I could see their kind of stress levels going up. So trying to bring that down was really, really important. Um, also, um, and, and for me and then my senior leadership team, we started thinking about how do we do this? So, um, you know, we had a show of hands about how many calls, you know, how many digi shift calls we've been on. I think I, apart from yesterday, I missed yesterday's sadly, um, but I've been on almost all of them took lots and lots of notes and um, listened to others, went through that massive Google doc that's just grown arms and legs and, um, you know, looked at um, what Bernardo's were doing in particular. Um, I was very clear with myself and my board that I didn't want to make a hasty decision about shifting something um, online um, without testing it, without making sure that, because, you know, whenever you're 
them into that digital space, it can be very hard to pull it back. So, so we wanted to make sure that we, were, we would get it right as far as possible. It, we, what really helped was that um, Dundee City Council um, declared Zoom a no-go zone. That, that, so that mean, meant that I didn't even have to think about Zoom as an alternative. Um, so so we, we started a, a kind of a comparative study with, um, with Microsoft Teams versus um, Google Meet. Um, so that we could we could kind of come up with some options. That comparative document, I'm more than happy to share that because um, Laura and my team, who is amazing and you know likes to go through things in a great deal of detail, um, was able to kind of um, help us reach the decision that that um, G Suite and Google Meet was going to help us to meet our safeguarding requirements, but also less clunky, you know, end-to-end um, -end encryption, better kind of um, kind of uh, kind of video um, video kind of uh, quality. Um, but also, also kind of the, the, it's very easy. Like a, there's a, like a one click thing, and it just yeah. Any everything about it just seems to, to scream. Um, let's go with G Suite. Um, so that that and because we were using Google Docs anyway, that was great. Also plugs into Salesforce as well, which is there's a there's a plugin which was really really helpful. Um, the other thing I think whenever we were doing that comparative document, because we had to then basically say to Dundee City Council, you know, we want to deliver a different service. Um, in a different a different way um so that meant that we were able to it kind of our, our our plans stood up to scrutiny so we were able to say we've not just kind of pluck something off off the shelf and said we're going to use this um and that really that went down really really well with the local authority and um, safeguarding in particular so the chief social work officer and the head director of education and social work signed it off um without any quite queries which was great for us um i then presented the the options um, to SLT, um, my, my senior leadership team, and then whenever the, the school holidays finished, in inverted commas, and the schools went back again, in inverted commas, um, that we got the team together and we 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 kind of spelt out what the what we agreed the alternative kind of um, methods of mentoring and staying in contact with our young people. Now we work with a huge range of, of diverse young people. We also have a huge diverse range of mentors. So we thought that we can't just give a well, this is it you know like one size fits all it doesn't absolutely not so we came up with five different options and um, for young people to stay in touch with either ourselves as, as, a, as a team and, and actually engaging with our with um with us as a charity feels really important especially at this time and um, so that's very basic text phone and whatsapp now whatsapp was something that we introduced um, just this week because we hadn't really been using it at all before and um, so we, we needed to, to put, implement a new policy in relation to that um, and um, Bernardo's you know that was that their, their kind of work around that was being really really helpful for me um, and yeah just putting some really tight parameters around that was important and um, the second alternative um, method of keeping in touch and this is actually so options two to five require additional consent which is another issue that we had to um, so the first option for us to stay in touch with young people we didn't need that consent but, but for keeping young people um, and mentors connected digitally and whether it's audio video chat we needed consent so we needed to create a, a simple way for, for parents and carers and young people to understand what they're signing up for, what the options are, in really, really simple language, but also a one click. So, so G Suite was brilliant for that. And again, Laura and my team deserves all the kudos for this because she created um, information for young people, information for the, the um, for mentors, also information for parents and carers, and basically created like a one click you know, can consent, which was great. Now, not everybody has um, access to, to smartphones, parents and carers, etc. So we, we, we also um, created a way that we could get verbal consent and, and um, get that signed off as well. Um, so that was just kind of a, a, a buy. Um, but also it took a lot of time to get those, those, um, those kind of processes working really well. Um, the, the third option is the chat function. So just like a messenger um, and the the, the only way that we're able to get around this with the local authority is that um, that the breakthrough school coordinator will also always be online when, when those kind of um, conversations are happening, safeguarding reasons. Um, the fourth option is audio chat. Not everybody wants to see the person they're looking at. Some people are probably fed up looking at other people at the minute and just want to go back to old fashioned chat and on the phone. Um, we work with young people who, who probably the thought of talking on a phone rather than just you know, pushing buttons just doesn't happen. Um, so, so having a, a kind of, like I say, these range of options and video chat, you know, again, young people, I think, I know that my mentee would just say, oh, Jenny, cringe, no chance. I'm not going to say, I don't want to see you when I'm talking to you, um, potentially. Um, so, so yeah, 
So having those that range of options, but also when you're working with mentors and, and you know people who are, you know all ages, all backgrounds, um, making sure that there's these kind this kind of range of options that um, that they also feel comfortable with. Um, but what we also know is that well, as an organisation, being young person centred is really important to us. So um, if if we're saying to our mentors, well, this is how young people want to be, in, you know, com communicated with, um, you know, our mentors hopefully um, will respond to that. Um, I think. The, the, the really key thing that we've done this week um, has been testing it amongst ourselves and testing it and you know you'll all probably have teams where you've got the you know there'll be that kind of that order of you know you know people who are really really tech savvy you know it doesn't even you don't even really have to think about it to people who are absolutely terrified of anything that's kind of new and shiny and and whatnot so, so we've got got a really kind of nice mix of that in our team so we've, we've been testing it particularly amongst people who are really quite anxious about um about what happens if it doesn't work so um and to be honest we've started using google meet uh, um, as, as an alternative to zoom our teams ourselves just to get to get used to it um i mean three times this week i've managed to hang up on a call instead of mute myself on Google Teams. So, so it's things like that, that actually, you know, testing it out amongst yourself before you roll it out, making a bit of a laugh about it as well. One of our young people who was the first pe um, person to, to kind of test it really liked the idea that, that she was doing something groundbreaking and helping us to learn as an organisation. Um, and yeah, so that, that, was, that was pretty cool. Um, I think one of the things um, I would say is that it was worth waiting. To, to do all the kind of the due diligence and the testing and um, and yeah and, and making sure that we feel familiar with it. Um, very important that we've got backing from you know from all the people that we need. The other thing is that we could we could create the, the easiest you know most um, I suppose accessible system in the world, but young people will do what they want to do so we can only do so much um, for that you know and and you know, of course we're working with young people who who sometimes. Um, you know, struggle to engage with others and to trust other people. So, so for me, it's my responsibility as a as a chief exec to, to do what we can to keep mentoring relationships alive, but also to keep young people connected to our organisation, and um, particularly now because um, I think that we 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 were we are going to start to see more and more child protection referrals because young people are living in increasingly challenged circumstances. We've got you know we've got spikes in family breakdown um, uh, and yeah. And, and, and homelessness and yeah so all the the stuff that young people that we support um are dealing with that's going to escalate i think we've got a really key role to play in that and i think that having this kind of digital connection with young people will start to be able to i think will will help it'll help us to to manage and potentially mitigate risk for young yeah. people too as well as telling them that we care about them and actually, you know, we care about them so much that we're going so far out of our comfort zone to, to stay connected to them. Um, and yeah, so that'll be cool. Um, I suppose the other thing is that what was really helpful that Dundee City Council in terms of that audit of young people who, um, who might not have access to tech, the, the intel that we gave them in relation to young people that we, we thought, you know, um, we didn't have smartphones or laptops, they've actually committed to, to, to um, meeting that need. And as an organisation, we've used some of our funding to top up um, mobile phones and credit and things like that. Um, and I suppose the next challenge for us is that I still need to recruit new mentors. Are we supposed to start in um, in Angus schools on Monday, which which hasn't happened because you know COVID? Um, so we still need to recruit mentors because lockdown won't be forever, um, and we need to be able to meet demands, which I think is actually, like I say, I think it's going to spike um, in terms of young people who need support. And um, so mentor interviews are going to be online. Um, I'm going to do some kind of info sessions around you know why why should you become a mentor, and um, but also um, mentor training. Um, which is another challenge, but well, but because we've only launched this this week, it's very very early days, um, and I'm really really keen to see how it goes. I'm quite happy to come back and share in a few weeks, and I see Laura's going to be talking to us as well, and um, so it'd be great because um, because Articulate is one of our very cool partners that we do stuff with. So I think that you and I are going to be probably doing some stuff in the coming weeks that's going to be pretty funky and quite different. So if you'll have us back, we can maybe come back in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. And chat. Cool. That's really useful, Jenny. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to quickly pick up, actually, because there's some useful stuff that you said in there, and we'll, we'll share some of these uh, things into the chat. We'll put them in the document. So there's lots of questions going on in the chat about devices and getting devices and data and stuff, and we've kind of covered this pretty much in every call. So a um, couple of things just to kind of keep in mind. So the government has a big 
program that they're rolling out at the moment, and we're involved in the, the pilot of that, so along with Aaron at SCVO. So there's a pilot right now with Glasgow Disability Alliance and Govan Housing Association, um, and we're basically testing devices, free data, and basic digital skills with people. And there's a plan to roll that to a much bigger scale. What that scale will be, nobody really knows at the moment because a lot of it's down to funding and partners from a lot of the big tech firms and a lot of the big uh, telecoms firms as well. So there's information on that. Siobhan will be able to share the link <coughs> to the No One Left Behind uh, blog post that Aaron wrote. And um, we can also now put a link to Aaron's Twitter account if you're interested in joining. He's got a Slack community. And if you're interested in joining that, you can get in touch with Aaron and he can add you to that community. Now, where that community is particularly useful is there's this gap period where the government may do something on a large scale. We don't know what that's going to look like. It probably only be for people in that shielding group, potentially. In the meantime, you're going to be working with lots of children, young people and families who don't have devices or data or basic digital skills. There's lots of people doing stuff at a very local level to solve that at the moment. And in that Slack channel, there's lots of people sharing what that looks like and how you can get involved and how you can take advantage of it. So uh, Thomas from Dad's Rock put in the, the chat there about people know how who are based in Edinburgh, I think, who've been getting refurbished devices to people really quickly. And they've got a big backlog that they're working through at the moment. So they're getting loads and loads of stuff donated. There's stuff like that going across pretty much all of Scotland. There's some kind of initiative like that in every local authority area. Um, Aaron's Slack channel will give you a good kind of signpost to what that looks like in your uh, local authority area. Uh, the Bernardo stuff that Jenny picked up on, the Google Doc link that we shared, there'll be a link to the Bernardo's WhatsApp uh, service that they provide. So they provide that to quite vulnerable young people. It's gone through a lot of rigorous testing. Um, it's quite a well embedded service now. So they have been really good in terms of opening up their documents and their processes for that. And they've shared that with us, which is on that doc, which is really useful. A um, couple of other things, just a thought, um, and a really good point from Jenny about speaking to your funders. So most funders have been amenable to the fact that you're going to have to change what your services looks like and there's a level of flexibility. Um, but do have a conversation with them. So particularly things like, you know, maybe you spend £500 a month on travel expenses. Now you're not spending that because nobody can travel anywhere. Is it okay to repurpose that money to go and buy a laptop for a member of staff who doesn't have it? So the, these are the kind of questions that you need to be having with your grant officers. Most of them are going to say yes, but I can't tell you what your, your <laughs> the person's going to say. There's also, um, and Siobhan can now put a link to this in, there's a really valuable page in the SCVO website at the moment, which has a breakdown of all the major funders and what the responses to COVID have been. On that is also a link to some of the COVID specific funds. So things like the William Grant Fund for Technology, and there's a couple others as well to help you kind of get through and navigate through this space and get the money to kind of make it happen. Right, I'm going to shut up because we're going to hear from Reid Aton from Young Scott. I'm going to have to click through the many screens to see if he's in the chat. Are you in the chat? Please tell me in the chat. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah, I'll hand over to you. Right. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you. I'm Reed Dayton. I'm the Stakeholder Communications Manager at Young Scott. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we are the National Youth Information and citizen ci Citizenship Charity for 11 to 26 year olds across Scotland. Uh, as Ross mentioned earlier, our, our digital information for young people is a, a cornerstone of our, of our output and, and thank you Ross for your, for your kind words. Um, so we were obviously already in the space of offering digital information for young people before, um, before COVID. However, we very quickly had to scale and refine our offer um, to make sure that we were providing the, the information that young people need right now. So on the 13th of March, we launched a specific COVID section of our website um, and started to plow all our resources into that. Um, we very quickly moved to a seven day a week operation and adjusted staff working hours and schedules to offer a uh, capability to one, produce content seven days a week to, and two, also to quality assure and sign off. We've got, obviously got quite strict uh, quality assurance procedures, so it's not just producing it, it's also making sure it's 100% it's, um, it's uh, what we want, want to produce. So we quite quickly shifted to that uh, sort of model of working. Uh, this is allowing us to keep uh, issuing uh, youth-led, youth-focused, youth-language information on everything that's happening. Obviously, a month ago, 
the information provision that we're providing, which is bang, bang, bang all the time, it was constant, constant, constant. It's not as much now. Um, however, it did obviously create a, a lot of work for us, um, but we, we managed by adjusting schedules to kind of cope with that and accommodate that. One of the uh, sort of best performing areas of, of content that we produced recently has been our Q&A format, um, output for young people. We did a couple of live stream interviews with the National Clinical Director, Chase Leach, and the First Minister before lockdowns. So we were able to get in front of them and ask them questions. And we sort of started trailing that three days before with young people, asked them to submit generally via Instagram posts, like what, what are the questions you want to ask? And then we amassed them all together and then ask them directly to, to the first minister and just leave and that worked really, really well obviously we weren't we're not able to do that now because we can't get in front of them so we're, we're changing our model slightly so we're still focusing on the q a model uh, and asking young people to tell us what they want to ask and um, but uh, partners are recording the responses and we're then broadcasting that out through our content so we've done some interesting work with um Professionals in mental health, obviously the mental health issues is, is huge for young people. Uh, so we've done uh, some Q&As with uh, Head of Mental Health Services for Young People at NHS Lothian, uh, UK Scotland's Mental Health and Wellbeing Officer, and that worked out really well. We have another um, Q&A with the First Minister, hopefully diary permitting, taking place on Monday, and, and we've had, we're kind of overwhelmed with the questions that young people are, are sharing with us. I think it's amazing the First Minister's office really recognises, although they've done this before, like that was a month ago and actually things are different now and actually young people have a lot more information but also a lot more questions. So they've been really kind in giving us that space to do it again. We've been working really closely with SQA. Um, obviously exam results um, are a huge, huge issue uh, and doing some work with them to help turn their, their output and press releases and guidance for young people into sort of young Scott language, sharing it, and we're doing some Q&A work with them as well, alongside um, the Scottish Centre for Conflict Res Resolution and other partners. So we like to work with, with uh, experts in the field, so we're trying as much as possible to, to identify the key issues that young people are living with right now and find the organisations who are expert at this, and then we're, we're sort of teaming up. So we share our content across all the major platforms that young people engage with. Um, Instagram is our main sort of information channel, but we also surface that on YouTube and on Facebook. Um, we've got quite an active TikTok channel, um, but feedback from young people throughout our sort of life of TikTok has been that's not the space for youth information, that's the space for kind of distraction and entertainment. So we've been trying to provide resources on there, um, uh, and just sort of more light-hearted content and not, not so much around the factual information, but obviously there's always a link back to, to our, our core core offer. Um, things like how to celebrate a kind of virtual uh, birthday party and we're, what we're really looking at at the moment are the key moments in young people's lives coming up that will be disrupted because of the lockdown and how can we sort of create uh, an intervention in the digital space. Uh, so party parties was one of them and we're, we're looking at what else is coming up um we've had a really positive um our analytics are looking really good um so we're kind of overwhelmed by the spike of the spike of traffic we've had um again we've been really lucky that partners have been really keen to share our information and, and point people towards uh towards this year information another project that um we launched this week was um, the results of our lockdown lowdown survey. So we partnered with Scottish Youth Parliament and Youth Link Scotland, and we surveyed two and a half thousand young people from across Scotland. So we had coverage from every local authority, which was phenomenal. And it was, we're really keen to know, there's lots of anecdotal evidence about what young people are worried about, but we really wanted to do some research to, to, to identify well, what are the key issues uh, and how can we communicate these key issues back to stakeholders. So we ran Lockdown Lowdown, uh, we published results this week, um, and I'll happily share the link after, after this call. Uh, so we found that half of respondents are worried about coursework, two-fifths are worried about mental health, and um, two-thirds of respondents are worried about kind of their futures and the impact COVID will have. 
Um, so this insight is really, really helpful for us for two reasons. One, we can share this with uh, partners. So we're sharing it with the Scottish Government and the NHS. And we're also breaking it down into geographical level as well. So we can share with our local authority partners. But it's also, in some respects, validating the information that we're providing for young people, but also guiding what, what we should um, should be providing. Um, and we are now, as of six minutes ago, we're now doing weekly surveys. So the key issues that have come out for young people, we're now asking all weekend the same question again. And then on Monday, we'll, we'll announce the results. And then we'll, we're hopefully, over the next few weeks, we'll see a shift. So the ideal would be worries about mental health will start to become less and less. That's what we all want. Um, but we're, we're doing this sort of heartbeat check-in once a week. Uh, to see how that goes. In terms of sort of how we've changed as an organisation, we have we also have we obviously have a huge digital information output, but we also have a huge face-to-face -face output which stopped. Um, I would say maybe kind of about a third of our work is our co-design work that we do with partners, where young people work with partners and, and co-design solutions to service design issues and policy. So we are. And it's not, a, it's not a completed piece of work yet, but we're working to, to digitise that service and how we can run these, what used to be sort of six hour face-to-face -face sessions online. Some of the learnings we've had from the trials have been, we sometimes work with up to 20 young people in one group. Well, we've cut that in half um, with 10 people. We're applying all the same principles that we would if it was face-to-face -face, so in terms of safeguarding and uh, our policies and procedures, we're, we're, we're assuming this is a physical space and actually the same restrictions that we place have to be, have to be put there. And we're using a combination of tools from that. Uh, so we're using Basecamp, which we used already. We're using Zoom, uh, Mentimeter. We're, we're doing that kind of how much work can we do before? How much, how much work can we do during? And uh, we're using private groups within Zoom. So staff members are taking young people away and working in separate groups. Um, and we're using Trello again and Neural for, for that kind of more visual visual piece of work. Um, and that is, that's an ongoing piece of work that we're doing, uh, developing that co-design. It'd be really interesting to see if this is suddenly maybe something we might choose to offer. Um, in some respects, we're quite excited by the reach that digital co-design could have in terms of getting to potentially hard, harder to reach geographical groups. So getting into the islands, there's, lo there's lots and lots of, there's lots and lots of kind of opportunities for that. Um, but that roughly is, is, is where we are now. Great, that's really useful, Reid, thank you. Yeah, it'd be interesting actually, one of us might follow up with you afterwards to kind of explore some of that, that kind of service design approaches. Because I think it's something that people have been struggling with and you know, whether you call it service design or user feedback, or whatever, however you do it in your own organisation, regardless of, of kind of size, I think, it's that kind of level of meaningful input in terms of developing services that a lot of people are struggling with just now because it traditionally sits in a face-to-face -face room and how would you take that online? So, so we might follow up with you on that and then um, get some insights on that. Uh, great. So we're going to hear from Laura Frood uh, from Articulate Cultural Hub. I'm conscious of time. We're still due to finish up around about half past. So we'll get kind of five minutes or so from Laura and Joanne Walsh and then we'll have uh, a chance for some quick Q&A. So Laura, do you want to, I'll hand over to you and you can tell us a wee bit about what, what you've been doing. Sure. Um, so yeah, I'm Laura Frood. I am the Empowerment and Engagement Coordinator at Articulate Cultural Trust. Um, I, my role is really, really varied. I do um, project management stuff. I work bespokely with the young people. Um, and essentially our organisation is about um, facilitating creative engagement and removing barriers that our young people um, face um, so I should say we support predominantly care experienced young people, but also um, those, you know, with similar challenges um, that our young people face. So um, our, pro our work is mainly, it kind of split across project work, where, which we do, which is either funded or commissioned by an organisation. So uh, like Jenny said, we've par partnered with Jenny, um, we've partnered with um, staff and um, the Centre for Criminal Youth Justice. We've a range of partners and deliver arts engagement um, across all art forms. Um, so it's really varied what we do. Um, we're a really tiny organisation. There's really only two full-time members of staff working on the, on this uh, the project. So we're kept busy. Um, so I mean, I suppose 
I'm, I'm referring to that as ACT, uh, Articulate Cultural Trust BC before COVID. Um, and then of course, um, we, on the 16th of March, in anticipation of lockdown, we stopped all face-to-face -face engagement. Um, and we kind of addressed the question of how, so it was never a question of if we're going to move online, it was always about how we do it. Um, and I suppose the kind of, um, the, the pleasure that we've got or the freedom that we've got is that we're not um, specifically linked or governed by local authority and things like that. So we had a bit more space um, to try out some of these different platforms and methods and obviously constantly kind of circulating everything back to that online safeguarding, um, which I think has been more than covered in here. So I'm not going to kind of do much on that, um, but we do that in a very similar way. We've got really robust um, a online safety guidelines in place that have been kind of designed in partnership with our safeguarding um, partners. Uh, and we also do things like the same way we did, do, would do in a workshop is we get the young people to um, design ground rules and we create an image for that and we put it up and at the start of every call we go right remember this remember that remember that and they all say yes and that's us kind of covering that side of things um, so I would say that what we've what we kind of done is that started um, delivering loads a range of different activities online and um, everything that we do is led by the young people everything comes from a conversation or an idea that they've had and we facilitate them through that journey of how do we develop that into something that's real and um, so this kind of space that we've got at the moment is really nice in terms of that because we're able to respond really quickly um, and all of our funders have been absolutely amazing in terms of yeah just just do it like just do what you've got to do sort of thing which has been really good and we had a fair amount of unrestricted funding anyway so we could start to deliver that um, but what we're finding is that the space we're the online space that we're creating, um, it's more about further exploring that experience rather than the outcome. Um, and we're able to kind of respond really quickly to what they're enjoying and what they're not enjoying. Um, we have always found that we become quite quickly really important people in our young people's lives and that they call on us for things that are out with creativity. Um, you know, and that still is, is, a, is a thing. Um, but working in this space has allowed us to really just keep bringing everything back to the creative and not get caught up in all those other little um, chaotic kind of challenges that they're going through. So we've kind of, um, we're addressing things like mental health, so we're doing mental health talks, um, we're addressing their online um, literacy skills because what we found is that they're not that great online despite what we might have assumed. So we've delivered some stuff um, with the Digital Bees. They did a four day challenge for us, which we can make widely available if anybody wants to deliver that to their young people as well. And it was really good in terms of starting that conversation about being more aware of yourself online and um, how your data is shared and used and things. And actually um, it's kind of um, kicked in a wee bit of activism in them and they want to kind of maybe link in with the Five Rights Commission to see because um, they were totally shocked about what people were doing with their data um, and then we're still doing our one or one-to-one -one mentoring where we're linking our young people up with a, a creative practitioner in their field and they're doing still working towards their creative goals so in terms of how we deliver it has changed but what we deliver um, and what we're kind of delivering against the outcomes is, is still the same. Um, I suppose the question that, that or the importance of the role of the arts now is so much more, um, you know, everybody is finding that the arts are now an essential component of staying well. Um, and I think that what we've kind of started to think about is, and it, we might be a little bit early um, in that conversation, but actually, um, about the exit strategy out of pandemic and how to this, how to think about how we kind of address some of those difficulties that our young people are going to have because actually although the arts is great at the moment for keeping people occupied and well i think the the um, transformational value of the arts will come into play post pandemic when um, we see our young people trying to reintegrate into society into groups and things like that and they're, they're facing those challenges so that's kind of our question in our rules at the moment um, we've got an, a, 
online program which is open to all um, if anybody wants to learn more about what we're doing i can share a link to an app that we've kind of created um and um the other thing i was going to say is that we are doing um just kind of craft packs so we've got about 600 requests at the moment which is just bonkers since there's two of us um, so we've got craft packs that are a, a viable service where we've packed up materials resources um, and just stuff basically that you can do um, for residential units children uh, young people and young adults as well um, but if anybody's got any questions or anything you know feel free to get in touch with me and yeah cool that's amazing Laura thank you yeah it's phenomenal the amount of stuff that you've been doing in such a short space of time it's amazing I particularly catch that it's interesting that like that kind of physical space while we're delivering stuff online and the ability to still post things and actually feedback we're getting I think someone on the calls recently about individualized postcards going out to young people um, and just the, the kind of niceness of that physical thing popping through the letterbox when there's just not a lot of mail or there's no kind of real physical contact happening in the same way so that's really interesting yeah uh, Joanne Welsh is going to come in finally from the Oasis Project. Joanne, I think I called you Joanne Walsh earlier. I'm very sorry for that. Joanne, are you on the, you're on the call. I've seen you. I've spotted you somewhere. There's so many little squares, it's hard to keep up. Joanne, do you want to unmute yourself and jump on? Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for having me. I think when I responded, I obviously didn't look closely enough and realised you were Scottish. So <laughs> hope, uh, it's OK that I'm here as oh. an English. Yeah, not, not you. Don't worry. No, a Scottish agency, I meant. Oh. You're yeah. focusing oh. on Scotland oh. rather oh. than. So uh, thank you. And I've already learned so much um, from this. Uh, I'm really conscious of Jenny saying that they didn't respond in a hasty fashion. And I think what I'm going to describe is we responded in a hasty fashion. So I'm going to go back now and look at what lots of what Jenny's talked about. So we um, are a charity who work with women, pr women predominantly with drug and alcohol problems. We've been around for probably about uh, 20 plus years. And uh, we've always had services for children and young people as integral to that model. So primarily we have a creche, but we've also delivered therapeutic services to children and young people who've been affected by drug or alcohol misuse in their family. Um, and that service runs for children from five to 18. And then we've in the past couple of years developed a service for young women who, uh, a th again, a therapeutic service, which we thought we'd kind of get lots of uh, care experienced uh, young women accessing that service. And in fact, uh, it's probably at least 50% young women who've just started at university in Brighton. So that's a bit of a mixed bag, really. Um, so I guess kind of pre-COVID, um, most of the children we work with are known to children's services or have been in the past. Um, our referrals are kind of predominantly half from parents or family members themselves and half from children's services. And uh, there's quite a lot of ambivalence about attending for therapy. And I guess just to put like where, where we're at now in terms of how we're operating in the context of our wider organisation. Uh, nearly all our work has been done face to face. I don't think our models really changed that much in, well, it, you know, I've been at Oasis quite a while. We've not changed it radically in terms of it's face to face delivery, it's one to one work or it's group work. That's for the adults. For the children, it is predominantly therapy delivered by qualified registered therapists, one-to-one, -one, same time each week. Um, so when we you know, realized that kind of change was coming imminently, we had to, um, oh, is that? <laughs> um, we, we had to um, really kind of think about what we were going to do. And lots of the children we work with are really vulnerable for all the reasons that have already been described really um, and it, it, one of the kind of key parts of therapy I guess if the therapists were, were here would say is it's it's important that we kind of maintain that we're holding the child in mind 
So quite often in um, fairly chaotic families, we'll find that um, when children are presented, they're often presented as kind of the problem or children are presented to us as um, uh, uh, they don't know I've got a drug or alcohol problem and I don't want them to know that I've got a drug and alcohol problem. And invariably the children do know that the problem in their families are around drugs and alcohol. So we have to think really carefully about what do we do to kind of hold the children in mind um, and not abandon, you know, generally kind of things about uh, starting and finishing therapy are really important. So consistency is very important, you know, even to the extent that therapists would kind of want to make sure they were using the same room, same time, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we have, as I said, uh, kind of, you know, there is a, an awful lot of ambivalence in general around the therapy, both from the children and the adults. So we have quite high DNA rates anyway. Um, and we kind of, as an organisation, at the point where we realised uh, we were not going to be able to um, see people face to face, did a huge kind of exercise of just like looking at the risks for everybody that we work with just thinking as well that we might have a lot of staff going off and how do we then kind of make sure that nobody's forgotten. So we've, um, yeah, one thing I was going to say about us as an organisation, our strategic plan from a couple of years ago, we talked about like um, becoming much more digitally focused. And I think what my report to the board every quarter has said has not made much progress on this this quarter. Um, so there has been something about how needs must. We have kind of... Um, all very quickly adapted although um i think skills are in you know uh, quite limited really at best so i think in terms of how we've actually worked some of the things we really had to think about in terms of so what what we've done is we've uh, kept in contact with families at the same time um there is that whole variation around you know you're not going to get a five-year-old on a zoom therapy call but some of the older young people who have got a, got a good relationship with their therapist the therapists are describing that they almost have delivered kind of like a therapeutic intervention virtually um, with others we've just almost used kind of phones um, and offered them uh, access uh, to families just to sort of check how they're doing in general um, and we're really conscious about the tensions in the house. I mean, 50% of the children we work with have lived with domestic violence. Um, and I guess that also brings something into sort of how we're working in that we're conscious that children are now in a space where there's lots of other things going on. So, you know, children might not have a room to go to. Um, you know, there might be loads going on, as, as you said at the beginning of this call, um, you know, how distracted are people, aside from all the challenges that people have outlined, like la lack of IT, lack of money, you know, most of the people we work, we live in poverty anyway. Um, and then one thing we have picked up as well is I think, you know, we went into this thinking we must keep in contact because schools are closing and having a bit of an anxiety that this would lead to more drug and alcohol use for families we work with and sort of went into we must keep in regular contact and then actually uh, this week I've kind of had, had some feedback that some families feel like they're being contacted all the time by schools by social workers by other agencies and that they're almost feeling like that's too much so we need to sort of work on that so we have thought a bit about confidentiality in terms of you know children saying things in a house where they might be overheard by parents and we are aware that there has been kind of particularly for older teenagers more of breakdown in relationships in houses and we had um, quite a few reports of parent to child sorry child to parent violence so we kind of need to bear that in mind also something that's come up that our uh, therapist who works with young women has looked at is the young women often are in a private space, but quite often that space is quite limited. And there's lots of kind of quite um, heavy going emotional material for that client group. And just thinking about whether it's appropriate or how you prepare and end a call 
um, sorry, I'm getting distracted now. Um, how you prepare and end a call where somebody maybe wants to discuss something about sexual abuse, but they're potentially in a bedsit type room that then they're going to be in for the next, you know, 18 hours. Um, so just thinking about some of that, but I guess just to sort of round up what it has made us very much think about is, um, I mean, things we've got to think about now is, is what we're delivering therapy. Um, some of it feels like it almost is therapy. Um, and what do we do then about our waiting list? Do we just carry on or, um, but I think in future, we certainly would want to be thinking about offering assessment via these kind of routes. Sorry. That's all right. It's okay. I just need to stop you because I'm conscious. Like yeah. some people will have lunch and we'll lose everyone at half twelve. So um thank you, John. That was really that was really useful. Um okay, what we're gonna do, because we're mm -hmm. kind of short of time, we're gonna take some questions. I'm gonna take a couple from uh, in the main room, um, and then we're gonna take a couple that have come through on chat. So Siobhan will pick out some of those ones. So if anyone wants to ask a question on the actual Zoom, if you can just stick your finger up and we'll pick someone. So you can ask a question for any of our speakers. So Claire McKee, I noticed you had your finger up there. Do you want to jump in and unmute yourself? I'm going to mute Joanne because her phone is I, like hanging off the hook. Sorry, it was just towards Laura Fruit. Um, she seems like really um, advanced compared to us. We're quite struggling. I'm new in post. It was just, um, I wanted to ask her just about is she a charity and is she, I know there's only two of them, so I'm presuming she is. Um, how is she getting around about all this? Okay. Uh, do, you want, do you want to clarify exactly what you mean by that, Claire? Of course. So, Laura, there's only two of them. Yeah. How is she managing 600 packs? Like, is she just like up all night? You know, like, no. is there any, could we help her? You know? <laughs> Laura? Yeah, if you want to help, absolutely. Um, it's that that specific development has been this week only. It's literally come in the door, and what we've found actually is that our referrals and our organisations that are getting in touch who need services has in the last two weeks just went crazy. Right. Um, so I, I, how we address that is obviously a conversation that we're having regularly. Um, but yeah, I mean, we'd love to partner with people who have got the same goals and things like that and work together. Um, but how it's... Sorry. Hey? Who's referring 600? Okay, I'm, I'm going I'm to stop you there because this is a conversation for off the Zoom and we have two yeah, minutes left to get all the questions. So you can email each other. Yeah. So, you can have your chat about the 600 packs somewhere else. This is, uh, <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, right. So I'm, I'm very rude as well, which you'll all have noticed, which helps with these kind of calls. Um, so I was going to bring in very quickly uh, Jane Miller from Children in Scotland. I don't know if she wants me to bring her in, but I'm going to bring her in anyway, because I know Children in Scotland have been kind of gathering up a lot of intelligence about what's happened across the sector. And I thought, Jane, give us like one or two things that you want to kind of tell us about this happened across kind of children's services? Um, well, I think what I would sort of say is kind of some of the stuff that Reid was saying about our practices. So thinking that we've moved to the digital sphere when we work with children and young people is very much thinking about what did we do before um, and keeping up in terms of like child protection. Um, a lot of our work is based um, and our members work is based on our principles and guidelines. So it's very much trying to adapt to the digital sphere without losing anything. Because I think there's a bit of a, across the sector, a bit of a fear that um, <clears throat> we have to do things really differently and kind of overcompensate for what we're doing. So it's very much thinking about what did we do before, how can we adapt and how can we make things quite safe. So that's kind of what we're kind of focusing on. I think with us, what we've kind of got a little bit of a concern with is that a lot of our work is for under 12. So we do a lot of work in primary schools and how can we make sure that we're making, making the best use of this time to make sure we reach those groups. So a lot of that could be maybe producing packs for schools or producing um, things that can reach the parents that can then reach the children. But then again, it's kind of some of the stuff that other people have said. At the moment, I think a lot of children are feeling quite bombarded and overwhelmed with the amount of teaching and homeschooling, that we need to make sure that we're keeping in touch and making sure their voices are heard, but doing so in a way that's not gonna overwhelm them and their parents as well. So it's very much um, a, 
I think it's quite an experimental phase for the sector and very much trial and error and seeing what works, but always going back to the things that you would do in an offline sphere and applying them. So your child protection policies, um, good principles and practice and very much back to relationships and relationship building. Yeah, that's really useful. Thank you, Jane. Siobhan or Maddie, is there anything that you want to bring in from chat that you've seen any questions? Um, there's, it, it, it's really great, actually. There's loads, and I'm just you know, couldn't, aware of time. I think there's there's kind of key themes that are generally coming out, and ones around sharing um, consent forms, policies, procedures. Um, I think a uh, part of that last uh, some things have been answered around working with um, under ten. So there's there's kind of questions around there, and it sounds very much again like some of this information is in the Google Doc already. So I would certainly advise people to go back, take that minute, get your cup of tea, have a breather, take your time, as Jenny said, take a bit of a time and, and kind of read through there because there's lots of things there that I think answer some of these questions or most of these questions that are coming up yeah. around yeah. that kind of sharing. But there was one, I think, from Mark Langdon around starting a, a petition. I know, sorry, Mark, you were waving. I know Ross is terrible. He doesn't see folk. Um, around uh, the starting an online petition for free data access but I th is there is there something out there already around that or is that part of the no one left behind is because I was snook doing something around that I can't quite remember yeah I mean there's there's certain things like um being able to access without having your data cap certain sites like NHS inform for example and government sites um I guess there's bigger questions about if it's data across the board and it's not just about accessing NHS sites then yeah there's not really a kind of comprehensive UK-wide programme I mean so the stuff that's happened in Scotland is kind of Scotland focused but there's UK-wide stuff happening that I know BT and Nominate are involved in doesn't help anyone at this point in time what a lot of uh, young people's services have been doing particularly in Scotland is, is buying prepaid data SIM cards and literally posting them out to children and young people um, so there's, and again, I would just, I would urge you to go and rather than try to figure this stuff out yourselves, loads of people have done all this stuff, is go, the, the document which Maddie mentioned, but also Aaron's uh, Slack channel is specifically around digital inclusion, so about getting devices, getting data, and getting basic digital skills to people. Um, so that's a really, really useful space. Sorry, Maddie. Um, I can add, I can invite people to that space. So I'll put my email address in there and you can just email me instead of having to find Aaron. And then I can actually invite you to that space if you're interested. Brilliant. Perfect. That's ideal. Yeah. So I think, I mean, one of, just to kind of finish up, um, Maddie's touched on this already, is the, the senior Digital Senior Leaders Programme, which Maddie and I run, which has been run since 2016. There's one kind of core principle that underpins that is someone somewhere will be doing the thing that you want to do already, assume it exists, and go out there and find that thing. Now, that Google document, which you mentioned, has is basically is categorised. So it has like a children and people's services category, it has a mental health category. And in that big Google doc, you can go and find not just case studies, but right down to the nitty gritty of what does an onboarding policy look like for someone who's under the age of 10, who's using a digital service, or we want to use WhatsApp. What does that practically look like in a corporate environment or a charity environment? So that kind of level of detail is covered in that Google document there will be almost nothing that any of you want to do that another charity hasn't done already, whether it's during COVID or pre-COVID. Go with that assumption and go with the assumption that you can go and speak to that charity and find out what works. How do they safeguard children and young people? Um, you know, what does the platform look like? There was questions in there about Discord and about US servers. You shouldn't be thinking about going away and investigating all of this stuff yourselves, particularly your smaller charities, is if a bigger organisation has done that groundwork already, you need to learn from what, what they've done. And particularly, the, um, I would urge you to go and look at the Bernardo's use of WhatsApp. Even if you're not going to be using WhatsApp, they have given really detailed breakdowns of how the process works, how they safeguard children and young people. And you can basically lift that and apply it to almost any digital one-to-one -one service that you're going to be providing to children and young people. So that's really, really useful. Um, final thing I was just going to quickly say is we've been getting anecdotally lots of stuff around services, not just in children and young people's field, that are struggling through this period. So um, I'd heard anecdotally from a, an art therapy service that the chief exec had taken the decision to basically just close the doors during COVID. So rather than thinking, well, we work with lots of vulnerable young people in an art therapy service and we're now going to deliver that digitally, they just don't provide the service at all. 
And we know now anecdotally that there's lots and lots of this happening across the country. Sometimes it's not a complete charity close down, uh, but sometimes it might be that you deliver six core services and now only one of them is going to be deliver delivered digitally. Uh, Maddie, I don't know if you want to share kind of without mentioning names, some of the stuff that came in from that survey about the level of services that aren't kind of making the transition. Um, so it was really kind of early days from the survey. I think they'd had, was it 41, 47? It was 41 respondents and 37% were saying that they'd, they didn't know how to put their services online. So, and, and I mean, it is very, the survey's only been out for a couple of days. So obviously it's really kind of early days, but it, it generally, from that point of view, that's quite a shocker to hear that quite quickly, I think, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if, if there's, if for those of you in this call, like a lot of you in this call have made that transition, for those of you who haven't, or you feel that it's now just a tiny part of what you do as an organisation, or maybe your board is really struggling with this stuff, um, you can get in touch. There's a link on the Google Doc, which is a form where you can basically apply for support. Um, and one of us will get in touch with you to, to look at what type of support you need. And um, so we'll make sure that link is, is on the document. Siobhan, is there anything you wanted to kind of add? Anything we've missed? Um, just to kind of uh, finish up on a nice high. So okay. um, That's always Maria good. has said uh, that the Young Scott coronavirus information is amazing. Thank you. So just to send those people back to that website. And then a question for Reed at Young Scott is mm -hmm. uh, whether they're planning to coordinate something around the end of school for primary and high school children. So that's a good question. Asked yeah, that's that a great question. Out that it's usually a time for celebration, emotional time. And can we do anything to help young people? Yeah, we are. We're um, we're hoping to launch something next week. It's still uh, kind of allowed that kind of like final prom graduation that we're definitely we are looking into that right now um so kind of watch this space i'm very happy to share details of that um when they when they come out and anyone who wants to get in touch to chat about it i've put my email address in the chat so just um pay me a message okay well we will we'll finish up there and um, thank you very much for joining just to say as well uh, the links to the sign ups for next week's will be uh, will be in the documents. So we've got one on Thursday at 11 a.m. You can keep me right, Siobhan, Maddie, if I'm wrong with times here. Thursday at 11 a.m. is about building online communities. And then we've got one the same time, same uh, day next week. So Friday, 11.30 a.m. is specifically around Crisis Housing, which will affect a lot of the, the families that you're working with at the moment. So hopefully some of you will, will join us in those calls. Everyone is welcome to the calls. So there's the kind of point about mm -hmm. uh, not being a Scotland-based service. It so happens that I'm based in Scotland. The SCVO is the Scottish equivalent of NCVO, so it's Scottish uh, Council of Voluntary Organisations. You don't have to be a Scottish charity to join. So we've got quite a lot of charities from across the UK. I mean, the, the Beth call, we had people from across the world joining that call. So yeah, you don't have to be a Scotland-based charity to, to join these. Grand, well, thank you very much for coming along. Enjoy the rest of your Friday and enjoy your weekend. See you all later. Bye-bye. Thank you. I don't know how long I need to wave for in these calls. There's so many people. I think I'll just be here waving forever. Like the Queen. Yeah. I might get a fake hand, like a mannequin's hand. I can just go like that to stop any kind of repetitive strain injury. I don't know where to buy one of those online, to be honest. Ali! So very sad. Keep waving. <laughs> Does the wave make people leave the call? Is that a thing? Okay, cool. Thanks, Ross. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Amazing. Sarah said she doesn't want to go because she's enjoying your banter. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. No, that's kidding. <laughs> Amazing. See you later. I do enjoy a wave, I must admit. I enjoy a wave. It's good, isn't it? Right, I'm just going to quickly... I miss sea waves. It makes me feel get good. to the beach. <laughs> I know. I know, yeah, totally. You want to pause recording? Uh, yes, good point. I'll just about stop recording.